their expectations. But then God has his expectations, and he wants us always to deliver the word according to the word and not according to man. Amen? So let me just pray uh, before we get started. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come once again to lift up your holy name, to praise you, to learn more about you, to be settled in you and know how to rest in you, Father God. Holy Spirit, as I speak today, let it be you speaking and not me. I decrease so that you may increase. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our God, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Now, how many of you have read the book of Ephesians? A few of you. Many, many years ago, when I first started church, there was a young lady in the choir, and she would always have a word for people. And she was getting ready to leave because they were moving, and she came to me and she said, I have a word from you from the Lord. She said, you keep reading Ephesians. You read the book of Ephesians. I said, okay. I didn't read it right away. I'm just going to say, okay? I didn't read it right away. But as I have studied, I realized the importance of when you get a word from God to obey. Because this book was rich and it was for me for that time, but not just for that time, but for right now. Amen? Amen? So when I started studying, um, really what I started out with is not what I ended up with, because that's how God works. I really wanted to talk to the church about brokenness, because when we look around and we look at the saints, meaning the body of Christ, do you know when we say the body of Christ, we're talking about you? Every single one of you. We are the body of Christ. Amen? And how blessed are we to be able to say that? Thank you, Jesus. So when we look at the body of Christ, what is happening today is that it's starting to look more and more like the world. Amen? If we look like the world, then how are we going to draw all men to us? How are we going to effectually do the great commission, which is go ye therefore. We can't be doing what they do in the world and then tell somebody that they need to come to Jesus. Because they're going to look at you and say, no, nah, bro, mm, sister, I saw you last night in the bar. I it. <laughs> you know, say it. I got this. Because you were doing what they do. Probably did it worse than they did. And it is unfortunate that it, it is like that. Those of you who have been with us on the prayer line on Thursday nights have heard me talk about the church in a coma. Now, I mean, many people have said the church has fallen asleep. When things start going on, when things are happening, the church, we're not saying anything about it. It's not being talked about in the pulpit. It's almost as though we say, well, we, if we go to sleep and wake up, it might be fixed. No. But the church is more than just asleep. It is in a deep coma. The devil is having his way way too much. And the saints need to rise up and pray. The foundational scripture that we have for the prayer line is 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. There are some things that the Lord said will, he will do if we do that. But we haven't been doing that enough. Not enough to really say that we're making a difference. So there are so many people in the body of Christ that are broken, that are having issues. We got problems. We're stressed to the max some committing suicide, doing all the things that the unsaved do. Why is that? So as I studied and God gave me scripture, I said, 
okay, I found myself going to a different place altogether. And our scripture today is coming from the second chapter of Ephesians, verses 1 through 10. Now, I don't think I'm going to get through all of them, but we're going to try to make a dent because it is important. Um, as I spoke to the Lord, it was, I said, okay, well, Father, what do I do? What do we do? How do I talk about this? He said, listen, the word is not anything that you haven't heard, but we need to bring it to our remembrance. Because my question to you today would be, why are you here? Why are you in church today? Who are you? Can you answer those questions? Why are we still in bondage? Okay. Because it's true. Many people don't really know how to say why they're here. You know, we'll, the old adage, oh, I came to praise the Lord. Mm -hmm, I came to hear a good sermon. But the thing about it is they've come to hear this good sermon to make them feel good right then and there. By the time you say your goodbyes and your hellos and, and how you're doing and what you're doing next week, walk to your car, get in the car, I guarantee you, you could not regurgitate what was told you. You just know it was good and you felt good at the time. That's not why we preach the gospel. It is preached for your edification. It is preached to strengthen you, to give you a hope that the Lord said in Jeremiah for your future, to help you to understand who you are in Christ, what he has done for you, whom you belong to really, and what power and authority you have over the enemy. You see, when the enemy comes in like a flood, many saints don't have the equipment, have not been spiritually equipped to fight the enemy. I've preached before on the armor of God. How many saints put on that armor every day? Well, I'm saying. You come to church, you go to work, you wake up, you around your house, ill-prepared for what the enemy is planning for you. And he's able to plan and execute his strategy because he sees that you are not prepared. So he knows he can inveigle, he can wiggle himself in, and the next thing you know, all hell is breaking loose in your life. So as a reminder, I'm going to take you through Ephesians 2 so we can put in remembrance so you can be reminded, strengthened, and edified as to what God has done for you and me and all of the body of Christ. Amen? The book of Ephesians is awesome. It's a little book. Six chapters. In this book, Paul talks about love, agape love, that agape love that surpasses everything. He talks about love 19 times in the book of Ephesians. Now, throughout all the books that Paul has written, which, you know, he talks about love 105 times. But 19 of those times is in this tiny little book of Ephesians. And the love that he talks about is God's love for us. And we need to understand and be reminded today about how great that love is. Amen? So, when before we go to the book of Ephesians, you know me, I always like to lay a little foundation for you, right? To get you to understand where we are. Is there anybody who doesn't have a Bible that needs a Bible? Because the ushers have them. I want you, there's a hand up right there. So if you can get it to, I want you to be able to follow me and to follow this word because it's very important. There's some things that you'll be able to see when you look at it 
through the word and you're following it through the Bible, okay? So we're going to chapter two, but just as a refresher, in chapter one, Paul discusses God's eternal plan. And that eternal plan was that though there are people that he chose, that he predestined to sonship, to be his son. And now when sonship doesn't mean it's just male. When many times in the Bible when it talks about man, it means mankind. So that's male and female. Amen? So I just want to clear that up because I was talking to someone the other day and they said, well, it's always talking about the men. No, you just need to understand your word. Now in chapter 2, where we're going, he explains the execution of this plan and then places uh, you and I in the church, in the body of Christ. So as I was writing this and as I read chapter, that chapter, verses 1 through 10, it talked about death and life. And so I thought, hmm, from death to life. And actually, Holy Spirit said, dead or alive. There's a song that was written by Peter Tosh. You know that? I'm wanted, dead and alive by the evil forces. He said, I'm wanted, dead and alive, and there's no place to hide. Well, we're going to talk today about are you dead or are you alive? Amen? So, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, and you. Who do you think they talk, Paul is talking about? And you. Say it. And you. Yes. That means you. So instead of and you right now, say, put your name for you. And Brenda. And Houston. And put, put it there. And you. He made what? What did he say in that? He made what? He made alive. Hallelujah. When we were dead, slain by our trespasses and our sins. Trespasses means our missteps. You know what sin is. We were unregenerate. That means we were deceitful. We were disobedient. We were scandalous. We were sinful. We were perverted. All those things. But while we were there, in our sins, he made us alive. Hallelujah. When you're dead in your sins and trespasses, we're not talking about physical death. We're talking about spiritual death because there are a whole lot of unsaved people out there that are fully alive and doing what they want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do because it feels good, feels right. That's it. I don't want to think about nobody's God. I'm doing my thing. And they are fully alive. But we are talking about spiritual death. And that signifies an absence of communication with the living God. Hello? Are you listening to me? Okay. One who is dead spiritually has no communication with God. I'm not talking about. They're separated from God, as we were at one time, were we not? And we need not forget about that, because there was a time when we were dead in our sins. But God made us alive. Amen? People who are dead in their sins, you know, now all of a sudden, you some some. Folks in the church, they believe that they're alive and they are saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. So when they see another sinner, what do we do? Mm. We're ready to talk about them. We look down our nose at them. But the fact that you hate sin should not impede the love that you should have for that sinner. Amen? Because guess what? If God did that to us, where would we be? We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be sitting in a pew. We might be pushing up daisies. 
there are many of us who said before I got to, even our pastor said before he knew Christ, he was the drugs and the high life and, you know, all the other trappings of the world he was in. Amen? The spirit man was dead. Hallelujah. This flesh lives, but that's it. Let me tell you a little thing about sin. If we are ruled by sin, we are going to be ruined by sin. Amen? Amen. The wages of sin is what? Death. Let me help you to understand that the wages of sin have never been reduced. Okay? They may reduce your wages at work. You may get less money if you change your job, but the wages of sin have never been reduced, okay? Our sense of sin will always be in proportion to our nearness to God. Somebody say that, our sense of sin will, be, will always be in proportion to our nearness to God. Amen, so that means the nearer we are to God, there's got no sin can come in. Amen? Amen. So now you, we keep asking God to draw me nearer, but God is saying, come nigh unto me. Because he's here. He doesn't walk away. He's here. He's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. So we're the ones that need to draw nearer to him. Another thing we need to understand with sin is any flirtation with sin can lead to a romance with Satan. Somebody say amen. Right? You flirt with sin, you and Satan are going to have a love affair together. Uh, that's just how it is. You know, and people say, well, it's just a little sin. Okay, but a little sin has a big price. And we, we don't know what the price is, but when we have to pay it, we, we, we can't handle it. The th in interesting thing about sin is if the price we had to pay for sin was immediate, we wouldn't sin. Because if we got what we need deserved immediately, that'd be it. Say, okay, that's it, I'm done. But it doesn't happen like that. You see, people think they get away with it. We sin and we go on for years. There are those who are looking at folks who are just blatantly committing sin and wonder, well, why isn't God doing anything about that? We have no idea the price that person will have to pay. No idea. Because it builds up and builds up and builds up. And when it finally comes and hits you, that's it. So flirting with sin is not where we want to be. But we were all deep off in it. Oh, we were having a good time before we each had our Damascus Road experience, right? <laughs> Whatever that was, whether it was in drugs and you, you were on your way out and you called on Jesus, whatever it was, wherever you were, that was your experience. And at that point in time, God made you alive. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. God has given us some commandments. Ten commandments. Do you understand that there are no amendments to the Ten Commandments? There's amendments to the Constitution. There's amendments to the Bill of Rights. There are amendments to the laws, the federal laws, the state laws, the local laws, but there are no amendments to the Ten Commandments, and there will not be any until this world is passed away, and even then, they stand. So if we know that there are no amendments to the Ten Commandments, what in the world are we doing? It says, do not commit murder. People commit murder all day long. And mind you, murder doesn't just mean that you take a gun or a knife and you kill somebody. You can murder a person with your words. You can destroy them. 
kill their spirit with your words. Be careful about that. So when you say, well, I'm not a murderer. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, you are. Yes. See, these are the things that we need to think about because when we recognize what we do, we know we need to do what? Repent. Amen? We need to repent. Okay. See why I told you I didn't think we can get through? Because I just did verse one. <laughs> but it's so rich. It's so rich. You, do, you can't leave this alone. You have to understand. We were this that is described. The condition that Paul describes, that was us. That's why he started out verse and you. You know, y'all, who now are saved and think you're all that. You used to be like those unsaved. Amen? Lest we forget. Keep that in remembrance because it will balance us out so we don't get too full of ourselves. But you need to understand a little bit more. This old condition that we had is talked about in verses 1 through 3. Interesting fact, when you look at your Bible, verses 1 to 4 in chapter 2 is one sentence. When you look at it, there's some colons and some semicolons, but it is one sentence, verse 1 through 4. Verses 5 through 7, one sentence, and the rest of it, one sentence. I want you all to study this. So let me just give you as much as I can today. So when we look at these scripture, we're going to see that there are certain things that Paul talks about. The main character we are talking about here is God. And with God, there are some verbs that are in here for us. We were made alive with Christ. We've been raised up with Christ, and we are seated with. Those are three main verbs that we are going to talk about. We're going to talk about the fact that God has made believers alive, raised us up, and seated us with Christ Jesus. All other issues are subordinate to this main topic. That's what I want you to understand today. All right? Verse 2, you've already said, and you he made alive when you were dead, slain by your trespasses and sin. By the way, I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. And I use the Amplified because it expresses the words. It takes an on more expression and helps you to truly understand the depth of the wording in this. So, verse 2 says, in which at one time you walked habitually. You were following the course and fashion of this world. You were under the sway of the tendency of this present age, following the prince of the power of the air. You were obedient to and under control of the demon spirit that still constantly works in the sons of disobedience. Those people are the careless, the rebellious, and the unbelieving who go against the purposes of God. Among these, we all, well, <laughs> among these, we as well as you once lived and conducted yourselves in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, our cravings dictated by your senses and our dark imaginings, we were then by nature children of God's wrath and heirs of his indignation like the rest of mankind. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? When you read this depiction of the condition that we were in, it doesn't feel good, does it? Does it sound like you today? Sort of for some of us because we've picked up some of those bad habits, have we not? 
but I'm reading this for you, and Paul is stating this, and God has it here because he wants you to go back and remember from whence you came. But more importantly, to remember the great love that he loved you with because while we were in that mess, what did he do? He stepped in. My Lord. Jesus. What we're talking about here is mankind's unregenerate condition. It, this world, and in the Bible when it says this world, it, the Greek word is cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S. -O -S. Now we see on science and discovery, there's one whole series they've done on the cosmos that's spelled C-O-S-M-O-S. -S. And they talk about the Big Bang Theory and how the, you know, there was nothing, and then something blew up. <laughs> I don't know what blew up yet. I don't know what ran into one another. I don't know what, what that big bang was. I don't know what banged into whatever. But that's how they describe it. Amen? They don't talk about God. They talk about this thing doing its own thing somewhere. But if you have nothing, then there is nothing. There is nothing to run into because nothing from nothing is nothing. Therefore, you can't have a big bang. As Christians, we need to be able to figure this out. When we look at television, you'll see people with shirts with written across it, atheist. Let somebody put on a t-shirt that says Jesus it wouldn't be shown. And my premise is you really cannot be an atheist because in order for a person to really truly be an atheist, they have to prove that there's no God. And they haven't been able to do that. Ask an atheist to prove to you there is no God. The first thing they'll look at you and say is, well, prove to me that there is. Now you ought to be rubbing your hands together saying, all right, let's start. Look at the trees, look at the birds of the air, look at the fact that we have oxygen, look at where the earth is, look at the seas by a perpetual decree. They have to stay where they are, hallelujah. Look at the fish in the sea. Have you ever seen colors like that? We have everything we need to prove there is a God, hallelujah. Look at the human form, my Lord, my Lord. So we need to understand from whence we came. We need to understand what God has done for us. Amen? It's been said that this world, this cosmos, is the satanically organized system that hates and opposes all that is godly. You find that in John 15, 18, and 23. This world, satanically organized system, because Satan, he's God of this world. You know why he has all this power? Because Adam handed it off to him from the garden. Adam gave up all his power. So now the enemy has it. Uh huh. This is the world we live in, in this satanically organized system. No wonder we're buffeted on all sides. The enemy wants to take us out. How dare you be saved? Huh. How dare you walk away from him? How dare you want to tell somebody else about the God? How dare you want to take someone else out of his kingdom? So he is going to come after us, but how dare you walk righteous and holy in his kingdom? Oh, my. Yes, he's angry. How dare you praise God in his kingdom? You know he's angry. Why? Because he was the leader of praise. He was the most beautiful angel. Couldn't nobody praise God like he could praise God. Amen? Amen. But he fell. And he cannot praise him anymore. So when we praise him, when we do what he used to do, he's not happy. Mm. So now 
when we have experienced God's goodness and mercy, we have the nerve to want to shout it out to the world. How dare we? It is it any wonder then that he is out to get us? All right. But that's really not the problem. The problem lies with the saints not knowing who they are and not being spiritually equipped to handle the onslaught of the enemy. He's doing his job. It is time for us to do our job. Our job is to become spiritually equipped. Our job is to walk in the newness of life that we have been given. Our job is to be alive and not dead. Amen? Because we have been made alive. Why do we want to pick up dead things? Why do we want to go back to where we used to be? Well, it's a matter of the flesh. You see, the Bible tells us there will always be this war between the flesh and the spirit. But the spirit man has been given power and authority over the flesh and over the enemy, and we have to use it. We've not been using it. The minute the enemy comes in, oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. Help me. I used to do that. Oh, God, if you just help me. And then I realized one time when I was asking that, oh, you know, you, you, there was this quiet. It was so quiet. Sometimes it gets so quiet that it, it, it's, it, it's loud. My attention was, I, I said to God, I said, well, you're not saying anything. Why? You're not talking to me. Why? I'm calling to you for help, but you're not saying anything. I've sat and I've tried to listen to your still small voice and you're not speaking to me. What do I need to do? I'm in this mess. Yes, I caused it. I did it. I own up to it. I confess. I repent, Jesus. Now, can you just help me get, figure out what to do? Help me. Take this away. Nothing. One day I'm driving in my car. I wasn't even thinking about it. I was just pitiful. Just driving and I was just pitiful. I think tears were streaming down my face. And the voice said, I've given you everything you need to fight. What'd you say, God? He said, I've given you everything that you need to fight. He didn't step in because it was up to me to use what I was given against the enemy. And if we don't fight, if we cave in to the enemy's onslaught, if we pick up the reproach that the enemy tries to put upon us, if we just sit there and say, oh, God, I'm done in, we're not going to get anywhere. He's given you armor. He's given you six pieces of armor. Five de defensive, one offensive. And that offensive piece, that sword, is going to take the enemy out. Jesus did it with three words. It is written. And then he gave him the scripture. We can do the same. The same power in the words that Jesus had, that's the same power that we have when we speak the word of God. Amen? Amen? We don't have to take on the reproach of the world. The world is walking around dead in their sins and transgressions. We are alive in Christ Jesus. We need to stand up and fight. We need to take our position on the battlefield. We need to put on our armor, and we need to know that we are alive and well, and we know how to fight. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So the problem, the problem is us. You see, the unsaved follow the ruler of this kingdom of the air. They follow Satan. The whole world is under his control. We are in this world. 
but we are not of this world. We're just here on a journey. Glory. We're here on a journey. We are Christians. Even when we backslide, even when we misstep, even when we have our own issues, we will always be called by Christ's name. When we die, we're going to die a Christian. When we're raised up, we're going to be raised up as Christians. Because one thing that we find here in this chapter is that we were raised with him and then we were positioned because we have been positioned and seated in the heavenly places. Now, if we walk around with this in mind, we're going to be walking around looking like this. And people respond to that. I've had people ask me, why are you smiling all the time? And they know my life is toe up from the floor. I said, because I have Jesus. Because it doesn't matter what it looks like. As long as I can call on Jesus, I'm all right. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, right. Call on the name. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. So now, not only that, when we were raised up, we were resurrected just like he resurrected Jesus. Our spirit man has been made alive. Amen? And that spirit that lives in us is our guide. We are to follow what the spirit says. And that helpless, hapless picture that was presented in verses 1, 2, 3. Hold on, y'all. Let me take you now to verse 4. Because you already know about what it looks like, what we were, how we were, what the world still is in many instances. And look what it says in verse 4. It says, but God. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to shout with that one. But God. This is the new position that we have. We are alive. But God, so rich in mercy. Mercy. Hallelujah. Because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love that he loves us with. Even when we were dead by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself. The same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace that we were saved. Grace, unmerited favor. We don't deserve what we have. But because of his great love, this grace, his favor and mercy, which you do not deserve, that we are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation. Do you understand now why Paul says this is a great love? Amen. Who in this world can do that for you? Who can raise us up? Who can make us alive? Who loves us with a depth of love that is unfathomable while we are in sin and dead to him and everything else. Who but God? Who but God? It's he who loves us unconditionally. It is his love that we are to pattern after. Because when we stand next to a person we know is a sinner, they need to see. And that really needs to mean something because you need to look at that person and smile and just want to put your arms around them and love them and tell them about the goodness of God. Amen? 
why we can't let them go. Y'all know that's right. We are supposed to tell them because it said, but God, oh my gosh. Besides being alive, we're seated in heavenly places. I can't get through to all of this because it's just too much. But will you, do you understand from whence you came? Do you understand that you are alive and not dead? When you are alive, do you go and crawl into a coffin with somebody who is dead? I'm just asking. And I, I, everybody shaking their head no. So then why are you picking up those dead things? Why are you laying and involving yourself with people who are dead? Why are you allowing yourself to become the reproach of those who don't love God? Why are you letting those people affect you to the point where you now start looking like them because you want to be accepted by them? Why? They are dead things. What they need is to see the light of Christ shining through us. They need to see the smile and the love of Christ coming through you. So that they will come to you and ask you what it is that you have that gives you the strength to make it through. Amen? That's when you can tell them about the love of Jesus and about the love of God and about how good he was to you. And that when you had smoked up everything, drank up everything, snorted up everything, done everything, been used by everything, that you could say, but God. Hallelujah. But God. In all my mess, God stepped in and gave me life, resurrected my spirit man. Because you see, it is our spirit that was sent forth. And he gave us free will and we make our choices. Amen. But consider the fact that it was predestined and ordained that you and you and you and you and you and all of you and me would be saved. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We have been given something that no one can put money to, dollars to, nothing. It surpasses everything that man could possibly imagine. Our minds cannot imagine. And not only that, but God has told us eyes have not seen nor ears heard what he has in store for us hallelujah his saints those who are called those who are alive jesus 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 so what do we do understanding that there's some things that we need to do number one we need to meditate on the things of god not on the things of the world they're okay, but they can't save us. They can't get us where we need to go. Amen. Amen. We need to study ourselves to be approved. That Bible, that's your sword. That's what you kill the enemy and all his minions with because they can't handle the word. The Bible tells us the word is quicker than any two-edged sword dividing asunder bone and marrow. Nothing more powerful than God's word. Amen? Amen? Know that you are alive and not dead. You may be wanted by the enemy, but he cannot have you. Because who God has in his hands, nobody can take away, including Satan. Because in the last days that Revelation said, he's coming down from heaven. He will no longer have ex access to God. Because you know he has access to him now. He's our accuser. He's in the court saying, mm-hmm, see, see, see what Brenda did? Look, look what she just did. Now, you know she's guilty. And see, but my attorney, <laughs> Jesus. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, that's my child. No, he said, no, she's covered in the blood. She is not 
guilty. And we have all been declared not guilty. Hallelujah. And if we sin, we can repent and we are still declared not guilty. Amen? Remember at Calvary, Christ crossed out our sins. Remember that Christ became a curse for us to remove sin's curse from us. Christ was delivered for our sins so that we might be delivered from our sins. If we walk close enough to God, there will be no room for sin to come between us. Know that grace does not offer freedom. It doesn't offer freedom to sin. It offers freedom from sin. Many people say, I have grace, so if I sin, that's okay. I could just go to the altar and I repent. No, you cannot pimp God. Sorry. That's not how it works. It's not your ticket. It's not a free ticket to ride. It's not a free ticket to sin. Amen? Because there are always consequences. We will be forgiven, but trust me, there are always consequences. Know that when we gain the victory, when we give up sin's pleasures in exchange for God's power. If we're willing to exchange the pleasures of this world for Christ's power, we are going to walk in power. You will not have trouble with finances. You will not have trouble with relationships. You will not have trouble with your job. You're not going to have trouble with your children. And even if you do, you have a word to speak into their lives. But we have to give up these worldly pressures for God's power. Sin is not judged by the way we see it, but by the way God sees it. What we see is irrelevant. Because you know, we try to make it up real nice. And the devil comes at it with, with sin, and he makes it pleasurable. Ooh, he makes that woman look good. He makes that man look real good. Mm -hmm. He makes those drugs look good and all the money that you can get from it, he looks good. And that alcohol, mm, doesn't that taste good? Ooh, and those dresses that we wear that show every roll and every, mm, doesn't we look, oh, come on. Sin, Satan makes it very pleasurable. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Until the consequences come until the liver falls apart, until your teeth are dropping out, until you lost your home and your family and your job and your money and your homeless. Mm. Those are consequences. But even then, if you turn to God and say, I need you, he will make you alive and not dead. Amen? The last thing, two, two last things. You cannot put your sins behind you until you're willing to face them. Many of us don't want to face the things that we have done and take responsibility for it. But when you take responsibility for your sins and you face them and you repent from them, then you can drop them like it's hot and you never have to carry it again ever. And the last thing I will say to you is beware of the high cost of low living. We don't want to be living down here. We have been made high and lifted up. He has positioned us in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Get our minds from down here in the world and our minds stayed on Christ, stayed on God, stayed on the one who can do all things for us, our provider, our healer, our burden bearer, our heart fixer, our mind regulator, hallelujah, our great physician, our peace, our joy, our battle axe, our, the mighty breasted one. That's who we set our minds upon and not on this world because we live and we are no longer dead. Amen? So today, tell somebody, I'm not dead. I'm alive in Christ Jesus. 
wants to live and not die because God is great he loves you there's nothing that you have done or can do that will change his love for you hallelujah so if we're all saved let's thank God father we thank you for this time we thank you for your word of instruction we thank you God for the word that you have given us that it is quicker than any two-edged sword, Father God. We thank you that that is the mighty weapon of our warfare against the enemy. We thank you, Father, for your great and loving kindness. We thank you, Father, for your son Jesus who died upon the cross that we might live. We thank you, God, for just being our God. We thank you for life and life more abundantly because that is why you came. Father, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory in Jesus' name. And let the saints of God say, amen. Wow. What a wonderful message that was from Brenda to Brenda. And put your hands together. Give God the glory. 